the Taliban overrunning everything and owning the whole country is highly unlikely. The Taliban have taken Afghanistan. Afghans are thronging to Kabul's airport. They took over the presidential palace. Afghanistan's president fled the country. You don't get to lose a war and expect the result to look like you won. That's how historian Stephen Wertheim sums up the violent and chaotic withdrawal of United States forces and personnel from Afghanistan. A senior fellow in the American Statecraft program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, Wertheim is the author of Tomorrow the World, The Birth of U.S. Global Supremacy, a study of the intellectual origins of America's interventionist foreign policy. He talked with reason about how the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were doomed from their earliest days and what policymakers should be focused on as we approach the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Stephen Wertheim, thanks for talking to Reason. It's a pleasure to be with you. So let's talk about Afghanistan. Uh, you wrote recently as the withdrawal was just being kind of clusterfucked everywhere. You said, you know, we lost the war. We shouldn't be surprised that we don't really get to set the terms of how it ends. What did you mean by that? I meant that somehow a lot of people who had favored transforming the entire country of Afghanistan by force and who failed to achieve that over two decades, somehow they apparently thought that having failed to achieve that, we would also set the terms of the exit so that it looked like a happy scene or something at the end. Well, unless you think that the Taliban are magnanimous and their takeover of the country is going to go smoothly and have no adverse humanitarian consequences, and I don't think these people do, actually, I don't think anyone believes that, um, it was bound to be a, a terrible, a terrible tragedy. Yeah. Um, so I think um, it's certainly legitimate to question whether the Biden administration could have conducted the withdrawal in a different way, in a better way. Um, it's possible that over the summer, it might have foreseen that the government in Kabul would have fallen quickly and therefore would have acted uh, more quickly to evacuate Americans and Afghans from the country. But it is far from obvious that that is a reasonable expectation, given that most analysts uh, who I've uh, heard from and, and spoken with thought that it would take quite a bit longer for the government to fall or that potentially there might be some ability to have a power sharing agreement uh, between the Kabul government and the Taliban. Uh, I, in fact, I heard very few people prior to the uh, exact moment when Kabul fell predict what actually happened in the way that it happened. So what I'm afraid we've seen is a kind of repetition of the hubris that got us into the war and sustained the war over two decades. Yeah, I, I want to get to a question about what the the U.S., I, and I hesitate to call it the Biden administration. I mean, he's in charge of it and he, you know, he has to own it. But, you know, this was, it. you know, how many, you know, he's the fourth president, right, to oversee this. But what about the collapse of the Afghan government that we put in and the army and all of that, the massive and immediate collapse of that does that, you know, is that an obvious, uh, you know, kind of extension, a logical conclusion to the folly of being there in the first place? It certainly proves the point that it was a folly. I mean, it raises the question, not only did we clearly not succeed in the nation building mission, it raises the question of whether the past decade of U.S. involvement in the war actually built anything. To see the government that was supposed to become self-reliant fold so quickly. Now again, I don't wanna say that it was inevitable from the moment Biden announced the withdrawal of ground troops back in April of this year that that government would collapse in the way that it did with the speed that it did, et cetera. Uh, but it certainly doesn't make me more inclined to think well, if, if only the United States had stayed longer, tried harder, uh, this could have been a successful mission. What could the Biden administration have done differently? 
uh, do you think that to, you know, not to save the country uh, necessarily, but just to get people out, uh, particularly the Afghans who we who allied with us and who we made promises to, uh, you know, what should they have done differently? The most consequential action would have been to evacuate Americans and Afghans sooner from the country. I mean, I think it is uh, as of the time we're talking uh, somewhere around 120 thousand people have been airlifted just in the last several weeks. I think that's um, an extremely uh, significant achievement. Um, but, you know, ideally, uh, look, not everyone who I would like to see be able to get out of the country is going to get out. Um, ideally, it would have happened sooner. But again, the very act of uh, withdrawing personnel and Afghans from the country would have helped to bring about the result of the Taliban taking over the country by right. clearly indicating that the United States had no confidence whatsoever in the Afghan national government. Uh, and that's why, according to President Biden, the uh, president of the country, Ashraf Ghani, uh, said he did not want the United States to embark on that decision. Now, maybe in retrospect, that's what the United States should have done. Well, in retrospect, it certainly is because we actually have the knowledge uh, of what happened, but we didn't have that knowledge a month ago. Uh, we certainly didn't have it several months ago. So I think we need to you know, take a sophisticated look at what could have gone differently rather than have this knee jerk reaction that somehow the United States government should have been able to control uh, the uh, conclusion of the war, which I, I don't think the Taliban uh, understood uh, or predicted that it would take over the entire country as as soon as it did. I realize this is probably an impossibly broad question, but if fundamentally, what did we get wrong in Afghanistan? Well, I support the original goals, or at least some of them, which was after 9-11 to wage war on al-Qaeda, which had perpetrated the 9-11 attacks. Now we can talk about, you know, maybe if the United States hadn't stationed troops in the Middle East, maybe 9-11 wouldn't have happened, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, they attacked us. So absolutely legitimate uh, and correct uh, to go after Al Qaeda. I also think it was correct uh, to uh, punish severely the Taliban government for harboring Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda. But then we did quite a bit more than that. Uh, very soon, the Taliban had fled the country. Al Qaeda had fled the country. And the United States embarked on a mission that was sometimes hard for even senior leadership to define, but can be summarized as a mission to build and sustain a Western style centralized state uh, run from Kabul. And that mission, I submit to you, was very unlikely to succeed, highly unlikely. I'm verging on saying impossible. Uh, and that is what then created what I think is properly termed a forever war, because the United States set out to pursue an unachievable mission. But even when many we're coming to the conclusion that it was probably unachievable. The United States also refused to quit that mission. At that point, let's say from the end of the, the later years of the Obama administration, America's war in Afghanistan truly became an endless war. He, uh, you know, speaking of Obama, he came into, you know, he won election. Uh, we're going to talk about your book, Tomorrow the World, and some of your other writings where you, you, you talk about this. He, he essentially won the presidency in part because he was the anti-war candidate or, uh, you know, or the anti-Iraq war. But he talked about Afghanistan as kind of the legitimate war, the smart war. Um, but were we extemporizing the whole time? I mean, it seems the Bush administration, which famously came into office promising a humble foreign policy, an interesting kind of repudiation of both Bill Clinton, but also his father's. Uh, actions in office, not to mention much of Cold War America. You know, we go into Afghanistan, and then was it like when we got there, we decide, okay, what we we really need to civilize the brutes here, and we need to 
um, you know, create a Western style centralized democracy and then things go from there? Or is this, you know, was there a, a, a kind of a coordinating controlling intelligence all along that was going to say Afghanistan, this is what we were going to be doing? You know, I think there is a mistake that unites not just the war effort that the United States pursued in Afghanistan, but um, the war in Iraq and the wider war on terror, which was that after 9-11, the United States didn't just try to provide security for Americans by going after the group that actually attacked us. We tried to prove that we were the world's indispensable nation, as Madeleine Albright had put it years before on the Today Show of all places when justifying why the Clinton administration was going to bomb Iraq. We wanted to show having been hit uh, on 9-11 that we had agency. We were the world superpower and we were going to utterly remake other countries and indeed an entire region of the world. So I think that's why that's both why the mission in Afghanistan continued uh, and uh, why uh, the United States went into Iraq. Um, because the mission in Afghanistan, as uh, intensive as it now appears, was seen to be insufficient. A mission that merely went after Al Qaeda might have ended quickly. It might have involved more than grandiose displays of military power, efforts to choke off finances, engage in some raids, you know, assassinate bin Laden, and that's about it. And there was a real hunger, uh, you know, on both sides of the aisle, in the commentary at, in the country, uh, for something spectacular uh, to follow 9-11 and to be sustained for a long time, and I'm afraid that's what we that's what we got. Yeah, talk a little bit about the uh, you know the authorization of use of military force after 9/11, because one of the things that's striking about it now, and it's it's hard to recall. I mean, it's only 20 years ago, but it seems like you know on a different planet, a, a different timeline altogether. Uh, the unanimity with which people in Congress, I think, what was there, one one vote against the a right. uh, UMF uh, after 9-11 out of everybody in Congress. Um, what was going on there? What, you know, what, because you have to, you have to go back to a few rare instances where there was that kind of unanimity in Congress to say, okay, we're, we're going after the bad guys. Well, under the Constitution, Congress and only Congress has the power to declare war. Its last declared war in 1942, that is against members of the Axis powers in the wake of Pearl Harbor, never declared war again. So we enter 9-11 with Congress already having substantially ceded its initiative to be the body that makes decisions about whether and against whom we go to war uh, to the executive branch. And the authorization for use of military force, the substitute for a formal declaration, uh, gets passed a week, it's a done deal, a week after 9-11. And Congress essentially authorizes the president to go after basically any entity that is in some way involved in the 9-11 attacks. It's almost like a, an invitation for the president to connect a lot of different dots uh, to be able to do whatever the president wants to take military action. Uh, there's no sunset on this authorization. And so this is the, the single authorization from Congress uh, that has underpinned America's post 9-11 wars, except for the 2002 AUMF, which was passed specifically to authorize the, the war in Iraq. And so all this time, the the Congress has, um, I would say, knowingly, willingly ceded its authority over war and peace uh, to a succession of presidents, which have then very much used those authorities and justified a whole range of military operations uh, against, uh, sometimes against groups that didn't even exist 
on 9-11. You know, the 20th anniversary of 9-11 is coming up. Um, and I sometimes think about, I, I hope with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, um, you know, that we're entering the end of the of the global war on terror period. And I think about it in terms of two images, uh, one from 9-11, people jumping out of the World Trade Center towers, uh, diving to their death, you know, because they know it's a lost cause. And then the images from the Afghanistan withdrawal of some people, you know, falling off of U.S. military planes that they were holding onto that took off, which is a sign of mayhem, you know, that they were close enough to a plane taking off. Um, are we... You know, there's this 20 year chunk of time now. Are we done with the global war on terror? Um, yes or no. And then what are the, what are the essential lessons that we need to really kind of focus and learn, you know, as we think about the 20th anniversary of September 11th? Yeah, those two tragic images suggest to me that the United States sought, tried to seek a measure of control in the world after 9-11. And we've ended up two decades later after trillions of dollars spent, thousands of service members, contractors, many more thousands of civilians killed, realizing that we do not have full control over events in the world. There's nothing, uh, 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 there's nothing called perfect security infinite security uh, and particularly in other countries our power to shape their politics um, is extremely limited even if we're the world's sole superpower we can't say today that the global war on terror has ended uh, it's no longer called the war on terror um, it was renamed a campaign to counter violent extremism in the obama administration i'm not even sure what it is now uh, but there's certainly uh, counter-terror operations that in recent years have been ongoing and uh, depends how you count. It's actually hard to figure out exactly how many countries we're at war with right now, but about nine or ten. Yeah. So in geographical scope, the war on terror has actually steadily increased. And the U.S. withdrawal of ground troops from Afghanistan uh, doesn't change that fact. And I expect that the United States will be involved uh, making over the horizon missile and drone strikes uh, in Afghanistan in the months and probably years to come as well. So part of what we are seeing now uh, is a, although it seems dramatic that the Biden administration has decided to end uh, the U.S. war in Afghanistan in terms of ground troops and in terms of the objective of trying to build and sustain uh, a Western-style Afghan government. And that is significant. Let me be clear. In another sense, the Biden administration is continuing a trend uh, in terms of the methods of fighting the war on terror, a trend that began late in the Bush administration, uh, continued in the Obama administration, even continued in the Trump administration, and now seems to be continuing again under Biden, which is a shift from uh, putting boots on the ground in large numbers to uh, adopting a low and no footprint approach to fighting terrorism through uh, commando raids and uh, aerial strikes. Is that, um, you know, and when I say is that better, is that a better strategy? I mean that keeping in mind the idea that uh, you know, the goal of U.S. foreign policy is generally understood to be keeping Americans safe. Um, is that kind of switch, is that a more effective uh, form of, um, you know, of fighting terrorism? Will it keep us safer or is it, you know, not neither here nor there? It's a good question. I mean, it runs the risk of making the war on terror more endless precisely because the costs to most Americans are so low of running you know, an aerial drone by remote uh, to strike a country instead of stationing thousands of US troops in a country. That might have perverse consequences. And we do know of drone strikes absolutely terrifying people and motivating people to uh, become insurgents and to fight the United States. So um, you know, I, it's not clear that this is a better approach. It certainly is. Uh, lower in cost 
for our service members, puts fewer of them in harm's way. And to that degree, you know, it seems like an, an improvement. But I think we still don't have a very clear answer to the question that Barack Obama himself posed, which is how do we know we are not generating more terrorist enemies for ourselves than we're killing. When you look at uh, you know our experience in Afghanistan, which I mean, it's it's really right to underscore that it's not over yet, even if we've withdrawn. But um, you know, was it you know did we accomplish anything good in the world? Forget about keeping Americans safe. You know, did we help the Afghans of the past twenty years? Did we? at least give them a sense of what something, you know, and I'm, I'm hesitant to say freedom, but, you know, clearly women and a lot of men on, you know, you get rid of the Taliban, you know, people can live lives that are a little bit, you know, a lot less repressed than stultified, but now they're back. Um, you know, is there anything that we can say positive about our experience in Afghanistan, either for America or for the people in, in Afghanistan? One ongoing issue is, uh, the admission of refugees from Afghanistan or people who may not qualify as refugees, but uh, were are, are vulnerable to Taliban rule. So there's an opportunity now uh, to do good beyond the people that have already been evacuated from the country. But as to the war effort, you know, um, for two decades almost, there were um, Afghans particularly women and girls in urban centers who were able to have much more freedom uh, than, uh, than they would have had under Taliban rule, now they're, that they're likely to have now under Taliban rule. Uh, and I do find myself absolutely moved and depressed over the fact that now uh, a life that they have built, that they had reason to expect would be able to continue is now very unlikely to continue to be there. I mean, that's a terrible tragedy. The question is whether on the part of the United States, the problem came from making a false promise, a promise we couldn't fulfill or giving up on the mission. I obviously think it's, it's the former, but it is uh, morally terrible all the same. Um, we have to hope also that the Taliban after 20 years are now going to have to try to rule. First of all, it's very difficult to rule Afghanistan, full stop. And now they're inheriting a country that, uh, at least in the urban centers, has had um, uh, experiences, women employed, um, girls at school, educate. And I don't, uh, I hope it's not a foregone conclusion uh, about what will happen. I hope that the Taliban uh, do, if only for their own survival and to avoid making too many enemies to their rule in the country, will uh, allow at least greater freedom uh, than they did earlier. Do you think uh, the United States, and I'll, I'll use these terms, uh, do you think the United States is acting in a reprehensible way in terms of our kind of cheapness with which we're processing or admitting or helping to resettle Afghan refugees? Well, some some representatives of districts are acting in a reprehensible way when they express uh, an absolute aversion to taking in anybody from Afghanistan who looks like they're from Afghanistan, et cetera. So far though, I think it's uh, too soon to tell uh, and hopefully the United States will be, will be generous. And I actually hope that this is an opportunity um, to redefine what humanitarianism in the world looks like for the United States in the 21st century. Through my adult lifetime, what most American foreign policymakers would say or in effect would, would do is uh, to say that humanitarianism, uh, the acid test of humanitarianism is being willing to drop bombs on wrongdoers. But that is a fraught proposition. It requires us to kill some people in the hope of saving and protecting other people. And we've seen time and again that that doesn't actually add up. Stopping evil is not the same as actually helping. So I think 
Uh, admitting refugees uh, may be politically difficult in the United States, we'll see, uh, but it is something uh, that should be the hallmark of a new approach to humanitarianism where our actions help directly uh, and don't run the significant risk of actually doing more harm than good. If, you know, one of the lessons, if one of the lessons of uh, the war in Afghanistan and of 9-11, you know, what came after it is that we really can't control the world, uh, you know, that we, it's it's a difficult idea that we're going to go and build nations out of thin air, much less, you know, uh, do region building and things like that. What are the lessons, uh, and you kind of hinted at this earlier, what were the causes of 9-11 that we should be reevaluating in terms of our foreign policy? You, you talked about Madeleine Albright, you know, calling America the indispensable nation when she was Secretary of State under Bill Clinton. What, what went into that kind of formulation? And what about that? You know, what was that a contributing factor to 9-11 in any way, shape or form we should talk about? I think it absolutely was. We really have to go back to the fall of the Soviet Union. And we have to ask ourselves why uh, the United States, instead of reaping a peace dividend that some people talked about then, decided instead to pursue global military dominance to actually increase the number of military alliances, to actually use force more frequently since 1991 uh, than the United States did during the Cold War itself. That, I think, is the fundamental problem. And Madeleine Albright articulated that agenda quite perfectly when she said that the United States aims to be the world's indispensable nation. Yeah, what, what did she mean by that? And where, you know, she, I mean, she's, I don't want to call her a ventriloquist dummy, but she's not original in that. She's people are, she, you know, American um, uh, kind of foreign policy predilections were kind of speaking through her. But where did that phrase come from? And why was she talking that way in, you know, in this glorious moment after we had, one, you know, the twilight struggle with international communism. I think the phrase could have been uttered um, any time after Pearl Harbor, uh, but it was, as far as I know, I haven't done the, the deep history, which would be interesting to do on the phrase. As far as I know, Madeleine Albright was uh, original in, in using it in the 1990s. And she explained that what she meant was, we see further into the future than others do. That, that's why we have to use force, in this case against Iraq. And so she is saying the United States is not a nation among nations. We see our right and responsibility as guarding the world. Uh, and we don't really owe anybody an explanation uh, for why we have that responsibility. Uh, our people in Washington somehow know what's going to happen and what's in the best interest in the world um, better than other people in the world, including people who are closer to the very kinds of threats that the United States seeks to diminish. You know, uh, this is a, a good segue to talk about your book from last fall, Tomorrow the World, The Birth of U.S. Global Supremacy, which is a fascinating revision of kind of received history of isolationism versus interventionism or internationalism. Um, and obviously there's, you know, it talks about this precise moment when the United States started to define itself as it was going to be the world's military superpower. It was going to be the hegemon. Let's talk about that a little bit. What went into that, you know, kind of, uh, consensus that got built? And as you point out in the, in the book, what's interesting is that it's not simply the result of Pearl Harbor. That shift had been in place for you know some time before that that's right the key years or even months were the 18 months after the fall of france to nazi germany in the middle of 1940 and up to that point u.s foreign policy makers and many commentators and observers thought that uh, of course the united states would stick to its traditional aversion 
to entering into political and military commitments, so-called entanglements in Europe and Asia. That was widely seen in the country as a, as a mistake, as unnecessary and counterproductive to American security, uh, with the experience of World War I having only reinforced that lesson. But when Hitler conquered France in just six weeks in the middle of 1940, that was an unexpected event. And it posed the specter, at least for a while, that totalitarian powers might become the dominant powers in Europe and Asia, or Eurasia, which was a very important construction at the time. And that confronted Americans with a, a situation that hadn't really existed before, partly because totalitarian powers were novel, uh, and partly because, at least for this moment, uh, Hitler had achieved what nobody since Napoleon had, which is attain mastery in Europe. And at that point, the country engages in what I still think is the most fundamental foreign policy debate, uh, uh, maybe ever, but uh, certainly since then, uh, in which uh, some people say, uh, well, we may hate the Axis powers, uh, but uh, as long as we guard the entire Western hemisphere by force, the United States will remain safe in North America uh, and its economy will remain prosperous. Coming out of the depression, the economy didn't depend very much on, on foreign trade. And others, um, including the people closest to power, including people in FDR's administration, came to a different conclusion. They re didn't really contest their opponent's point that American security and prosperity uh, didn't depend on entering World War II and attempting to police the world thereafter. But instead, they argued that that just wasn't enough. The United States had a kind of uh, identity, what we call today an exceptionalist identity that made it want to define the future of the world. And Americans also uh, wanted to be able to interact with the world uh, and engage in liberal style intercourse like trade, and that would become impossible if the Axis were able to win. And I think what's most remarkable uh, to me is uh, not only did um, the decision then get made essentially to enter the war, even though Pearl Harbor didn't bring that, that about, uh, it, 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 sorry, even though it didn't uh, happen until Pearl Harbor, but the United States was already aiding the Allies uh, to prevent an Allied loss in the war. What's most remarkable is they decided their entire notion of international relations had been changed. That there was no way to really have peaceful, liberal, American style interaction without backing that interaction by force, without the United States becoming the preeminent power and stopping uh, future aggressors before they were able to amass the kind of power that the Axis powers uh, were, were, were able to achieve at least for uh, some number of years early in, in World War II. So that decision, I think, sets us down the course of uh, trying to dominate the world militarily. Yeah, that seems to be the, the real kind of the original sin of, you know, the past 70 years of American foreign policy, if, if we're going to be critical of it, which obviously, you know, we both think that we should be. Um, w one of the most interesting things about Tomorrow the World is the way that it talks about isolationism and kind of how, where does, where does the charge of if, you know, be in World War II or before World War II, it, nobody, nobody really was saying, you know, America should have nothing to do with the world. We should just stick to our own borders and things like that. And you talk about how people who were later defined as isolationists, we're totally into the idea of trade and of commerce with all parts of the world. It's just that what they got hung up on was the idea that we should, you know, do everything at the, you know, from the barrel of a gun. Talk a little bit about how that charge of isolationism became, you know, a, um, a concept. And then how did that end up winning so that we're still today, 
you know, and I'm thinking back to in, in your book, you mentioned or in your writings, you mentioned this, you know, when Bush, George W. Bush came into office, even as it was, you know, promising a humble foreign policy, he was like, hey, don't worry, I'm not an isolationist. I'm not saying we shouldn't invade countries or things like that. So this charge of isolationism uh, versus internationalism or interventionism is still like the one of the dominant axes of, of foreign policy. And your book kind of shows there's a lot of sleight of hand going on there. So the term isolationism only emerges into widespread usage in the United States in the 1930s uh, and then even more in the 40s. Um, and it's used almost exclusively by um, people who are using the term to condemn it. Not many people thought that self-identified as isolationists uh, and thought that that described their worldview. Um, this term was instead applied to people who actually were quite uh, traditional and some of them self-identified internationalists. Mm -hmm. They wanted the United States to engage in many peaceful ways, including through trade, including through international law, which was a big, uh, big cause for people at the time, much more so than it is today. Uh, they just didn't want the United States to engage in uh, war in Europe and Asia. Uh, and for this, they were labeled isolationists. So this term functioned then as it does today um, to make anybody opposed to the use of force seem to be opposed to engagement altogether. And what that does, the importance of this term doesn't lie in anything it says about people opposed to the use of force. What it does is it makes internationalism, the opposite of isolationism, seem to require US military dominance. And that was truly, truly a revolutionary change in the United States. Internationalism had once been associated with pacifism, if anything, and it, it, and it meant yeah, Believe where trades it. cross borders, troops don't, right? If you're exactly. engaged in the world commercially and culturally, et cetera, you, you don't need an army. And, you know, we, we don't have to take those views to be gospel either. But that's what internationalism originally was. Uh, and it was transformed in the United States into a warrant for U.S. military dominance and the interventions that go with it. You know, uh, let's pause for a little bit and do the David Copperfield crap uh, that uh, Holden Caulfield mentions at the beginning of uh, Catcher in the Rye. You have a B.A. from Harvard, a Ph.D. from Columbia. You were involved early on in the Quincy Institute, which is this kind of great foreign policy rethink that managed to get funding from both the Koch brothers and George Soros. So you're obviously a puppet who is torn in all kinds of odd, insidious directions at the behest of billionaires from the right and the left, all of that kind of stuff. How did you get in, interested in foreign policy? And what, you know, what, are, what are kind of the keys to why you think the way that you do? Um, I grew up uh, outside Washington, D.C., I was interested in politics. 9-11 happened when I was in high school. I paid a lot of attention to the debate over how America should respond to 9-11 and then whether uh, it should go to war in Iraq. I didn't have a huge amount of prescience at the time, but I also remember thinking, I'm paying a lot of attention as uh, many citizens can't. And I'm not sure what to think about these things. Um, our debate somehow seems incredibly narrow. And so from that point on, really, I was interested both in the substance of U.S. foreign policy as it's happened historically and in the debate surrounding it. And so that's why I guess I wrote a book that, you know, not only talks about why the United States came to choose military dominance, but also how it legitimated that goal in terms of the pursuit of internationalism uh, uh, instead of isolationism, so-called. So do you feel, and you know, this has been kind of either the, the headline or subhead of some of the pieces that you've written, um, you know, are we reevaluating our foreign policy? You know, the entire 21st century has been a disaster by basically any metric other than 
you know, if you're a military contractor, you know, the 21st century has been a blank check, essentially. Uh, military spending goes up and up. But in terms of winning wars, winning hearts and minds, uh, saving people, et cetera, I mean, it's just been a disaster. Are we at a point as a society where we are actually, or as a country, are we seriously reevaluating the received wisdom of the past 70 plus years of America as the indispensable nation, meaning that we need to have the biggest army in the world and we need to be ready to be in, you know, a hundred countries or whatever at any given moment. I'm about to say yes. And then I think of some of the news coverage and, and talking heads of the past several weeks uh, as uh, the withdrawal from Af from Afghanistan uh, has come to a close. And I, and I, and I wonder, I wonder, but no, I think, I think, this this is a quite different country now when it comes to thinking about America's role in the world and issues of war and peace. Somehow, although this country didn't have a whole lot of diversity in its in its foreign policy elites over the last two decades, the country itself, the public, came to quite um, significant conclusions about our wars. First, the war in Iraq which again, without people taking responsibility, without much accountability taking place, the American people came to regard as a grievous mistake and they rewarded presidents Barack Obama in 2008 and Donald Trump uh, in 2016 for vigorously opposing that war. And then the country has come to the same conclusion by similar margins about the war in Afghanistan. So somehow, although we are living through an era in which our wars don't affect that many Americans and you don't see a whole lot of people marching in the streets, they do seem to matter. And that is changing our politics. And you see that in the fact that the Biden administration, uh, staffed in its senior levels by people who have been in prior administrations, no one thinks these are radicals, um, deciding to end uh, America's two decade war in Afghanistan, doing things that they wouldn't have anticipated doing before. So somehow we are, we are coming to a different um, place in US foreign policy, um, but you know, I am concerned uh, about where we're going next, in part because I think um, if we uh, make the kind of mistakes uh, toward a rising China, in the next several decades that we've made in the war on terror and in the greater Middle East, uh, that could uh, prove to be even more consequential. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because China, you know, one of the things is that the minute, and I'm old enough to remember exactly when the Cold War ended and how quickly everybody started to miss it, especially in you know, the broad based military industrial complex, but also kind of, you know, media and whatnot. And it it structured the world and it made, you know, it made for easy storytelling, if not, you know, a, a good life for people, particularly in proxy war countries and things like that. How sh how is, you know, one of the things people are talking about and, and groups like, you know, people uh, it doesn't exist anymore, but the Weekly Standard, you know, shortly before 9-11 was, you know, running cover stories about why China is you know the next Russia or the next Soviet Union, et cetera. And now we, after a twenty-year pause, we are seeing those stories. China is the Soviet Union, except this time, you know, they have better social media control and they they understand capitalism. This is really serious. What are the things that we should be talking about when it comes to living in a world where China is, you know, is a is a growing uh, power in the world? Well, the first thing is that we have to accept mutual coexistence. We have to insist that China accept that it is living in a world with a uh, vibrant and powerful United States. That's not going to change. Uh, but we have to abandon these fantasies of regime change, fantasies that we're going to you know, be able to exert decisive leverage over the Chinese Communist Party in the way that we, well, we at least tried to exert decisive yeah. leverage over governments in the Middle East. And, you know, we did depose the Taliban for a while and we did overthrow Saddam Hussein's Iraq. That even that level of quote unquote success uh, should be off the table when we're when we're talking about China. Um, 
you know, I do think that uh, China's rise, I don't see it as a positive development uh, for the United States or the world. Why um, not? Uh, for the world, uh, for the United States, I think it's kind of self-evident. But why Why is China China's rise to global status? Why is that a problem for the world? Well, we have to see how it goes. I mean, there are some positive elements, I think, although you hear a lot of um, threatening noises about the Belt and Road Initiative, development assistance, you know, um, a source of capital for countries, if it truly has no strings attached, big if. Um, could be a positive thing in spurring economic development. Um, but, you know, I think the fear, and it's a legitimate fear, is that China will become more aggressive over time. Uh, its military buildup hasn't uh, outstripped its economic growth over the past several decades, but nevertheless, um, it's a significant growth, and it could learn to project power and define its goals even more expansively um, than, than, it, than, it, than it has. So I think, you know, this is a legitimate concern. Um, but I am also worried that um, a China enemy suits uh, some interests in the United States uh, and helps to solve this problem uh, that has emerged over the last several years, which is, uh, boy, American global dominance seems to have a lot of critics in the United States. Um, these wars in the Middle East are very unpopular. But if we're able to portray China as seeking world domination, as gravely threatening Americans, uh, and by the way, we can also, you know, somewhat plausibly say we're just going to be able to deter China so there won't be actual wars involved. Well, that kind of does everything that the military industrial complex Mm -hmm. uh, about which President Eisenhower warned uh, would would want to do, and I submit to you that um, a, a getting into an intense zero sum security competition with China um, is going to put us uh, indefinitely on the brink of World War Three. Uh, China could do us great harm if if it came to that. We could also do them great harm. And um, China does not, you know, we're not about to be attacked by the Chinese military. I think very few people believe that that's the case. And we've got real threats to uh, Americans uh, where they live and work from pandemic disease, from climate change as well. All these things should incline us to have more cooperation, not with just with China per se, but with countries around the world with whom we do not need to be military adversaries. Uh, you know, it's it's an odd thing. You mentioned Trump in passing, and you've written in various places, including, uh, I believe, the Washington Post, that Trump's foreign policy, you know, wasn't all bad. And he clearly, you know, he said the unsayable, which is that, you know, even as he was talking about making America great again and, and kind of channeling and in kind of insane, primitive version of American exceptionalism. He was like, hey, you know what? We're not, we don't have to be everywhere. We don't have to do everything for anybody. Is there a lesson from a kind of Trumpian, you know, discussion of ideas that we should really be foregrounding? And is it potentially legitimate to say, you know, that Trump and Biden are more alike on foreign policy in the same way that Bush and Obama are kind of together? I don't appraise the Trump foreign policy highly. I've written about it very critically throughout the administration with the exception of that last piece where I wanted to take the opportunity to say something that was promising about Trump's foreign policy. And that promising thing is that Donald Trump really didn't assume that the United States has the right and duty to police the world, to guard something called international order, which is very difficult to define, by force. Um, now, he replaced that impulse with something that often seemed to be just power for power's sake. He said, our military dominance must be unquestioned. And he raised the defense budget even higher uh, to demonstrate that. So in many ways, he pursued this peace through strength uh, foreign policy uh, that, um, that really uh, 
didn't improve on uh, the record of his predecessors. But on the other hand, he did have the capacity to to allow um, to see other countries uh, in a way that that wasn't defined by the United States uh, and its military. Uh, he put the war in Afghanistan on a path to termination, uh, which his predecessors proved unable or unwilling to do. Uh, he did not think the United States was exceptional or indispensable to others. And so I think in, in those respects, um, he offers something uh, to, to build upon, uh, even if um, I think he, the dominant impulse was a more punitive and, and militaristic impulse that I very much uh, disagree with. Do you think Biden is kind of in a Trumpian mode? I, you know, and this is one of the things that has come up. Um, you know, particularly over the past couple of weeks is how Biden was kind of, you know, he was a skeptic of Obama's hawkishness. And, you know, he's been in power and in office for so long. You, He's like the Bible. You can find a Joe Biden who will support any interpretation of him. But, you know, is he for however long he has his marbles and or is in office? Is he actually pointing in a good direction for American foreign policy? You know, I, I'm not sure how much uh, there's always continuities between administrations on the issue of Afghanistan. Yes, um, this was a, a Trump Biden withdrawal, if you'd like to put it that way. I think on relations with China, there may be a kind of broad continuity in that both Trump and and the Biden administration believe the United States needs to be more sharply competitive, more adversarial towards China than their predecessors, though we'll still, we still have to see uh, how U.S.-China relations evolve under Biden. But I, I get the sense that Biden um, has uh, evolved in his thinking since 9-11. He um, was a proponent of humanitarian intervention before 9-11. He uh, supported the Iraq war, the war in Afghanistan, et cetera. But um, around the middle of the decade, as the war in Iraq went south and became unpopular with the public, um, Biden came out with a, a plan to federalize Iraq, which uh, I think may have been an attempt to um, avoid a long-term U.S. occupation of the country. Uh, and as you mentioned, under Obama, he did oppose the surge of troops in Afghanistan, though he still supported continuing the war, uh, but only for the purpose of counterterrorism. So I see him as somebody who is, first of all, I think he's undergoing his own thought process that predates the rise of Donald Trump. But secondly, uh, he, I think, is uh, in general as a politician responsive to um, where the public is. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and so in that way, Donald Trump's rise probably matters and that Trump showed that there was um, a public appetite, at least for something quite different from the foreign policy that they had gotten before. You know, and this may be too much of a mental gymnastic that I'm trying to do in my head, but in your book, Tomorrow the World, one of the major characters in a lot of ways, and he was, if not quite an architect of American foreign policy, he was one of the people that kind of broadcast that the journalist and statesman Walter Lippmann um, Walter Lippmann helped create this idea that America has to be everywhere and do everything. He was also famous for saying that the public doesn't really matter when it comes to setting public policy. Are we finally moving past Walter Lippmann in two senses, uh, you know, both that America has to be everywhere and shoulder every burden, and that we are now starting to acknowledge that, you know what, when the public gets tired of war, politicians, it might take a long time, but they ultimately, they catch up to where the public is. I think that's clearly the trend over the past decade or decade and a half even. Uh, and again, I think sometimes it's remarkable uh, how much uh, the debate over foreign policy has changed and how much certain policies like the war in Afghanistan now uh, have changed given uh, how senior people in the foreign policy community uh, have stridently opposed um, uh, some of these actions. 
So that is my hope that we're moving to a new place. But I would warn uh, that um, one of the uh, frameworks for American foreign policy that is gaining steam, along with a more general military restraint, is a, a focus on so-called great power competition against China, first and foremost, but also Russia. And I think one of the reasons why that has gained traction is that um, you know there isn't or doesn't seem to be a high risk of war with China or Russia in the near term. Uh, so it can seem acceptable uh, to, to people who don't want to go to war. Uh, but I think over the long term, if you think about how the original Cold War went, if we get locked into a Cold War with China, uh, and God forbid we should we should add Russia to that mix and try to take on both of them at once rather than attempt to drive a wedge between them, uh, then that may offer a respite from uh, some of the Middle East uh, nation building wars from the last two decades. But we will probably end up uh, intervening again in the Middle East or in the global South, uh, much as we did in Korea, in Vietnam, and so forth during the original Cold War. Um, I guess final question, as we uh, come close to the 20th, or as we anticipate the 20th anniversary of 9-11, do you think the next 20 years will be more peaceful than the last 20 years? I truly don't know on a global scale. I hope so for the United States. I do think that um, there is a uh, widespread recognition, even among people in Washington and the United States, that um, endless wars have been a mistake. They've been incredibly costly. Uh, and a revalorization of peace. Actually, peace is pretty good. It's a good goal. And in so many ways, war has become the norm in our system, whether that's uh, legally in terms of Congress passing the buck to the, to the president, uh, whether it's in terms of lobbyists and the military industrial complex or ideologies that say that anybody who wants to wind down a war is an isolationist. So, you know, I think there's definitely a, a, a good fight brewing and the uh, I'll say this, and at no other point, I think, in my own adult lifetime, uh, would it be possible to um, have a get traction uh, saying, uh, saying the kind of things that uh, uh, I've been saying and, and so many others now uh, in, in Washington and elsewhere who, who are uh, joining the movement to put an end to endless war and shift to a grand strategy of military restraint. All right. Well, we're going to leave it there. We've been talking with Stephen Wertheim, uh, author of Tomorrow the World at the Carnegie uh, Foundation for Peace. Thanks so much for talking to Reason. Thank you.